Today is September 27th, 2014, and this is episode 148. This program is intended for informational and educational purposes only. Cryptocurrency is new, highly experimental, and we're not experts, just obsessed companions walking the road towards a more peer-to-peer future. Welcome to Let's Talk Bitcoin, a twice-weekly show about the ideas, people, and projects building the digital economy and the future of money. My name is Adam B. Levine, and today we're headed off the beaten path. Recently, Stephanie and I took some time to think about the possible futures behind the BitNation decentralized opt-in government project, and how it fits into a world where location-based monopolies are the order of the day. This is a pretty wide-ranging conversation. Enjoy the show. Have you seen this bitnation.co website? You know, I've been approached by the woman who's running it to do some consulting or something. We talked right before I left, but I haven't had a chance to catch up. What's up? Mm. Well, it's they've got this full website and it's starting to make the rounds on the internet and I just saw it and it's it's pretty interesting. Basically what they want to do is like blockchainize a bunch of stuff that's usually done by governments like a registry of deeds and insurance and all kinds of other stuff. And maybe they'll have robots going around collecting your trash <laughs> on the blockchain or something. Well, they're, they're um, not the only ones that are doing stuff like that, though. That's basically the permacredits model, too. Yeah. And BitShares also wants to do that. And I think Ethereum wants to do it also, but in like a way scarier way. <laughs> and I mean, I think it's it would be interesting to talk about because like, Obviously, in a lot of ways, they're way better than having like corrupt politicians do these things. However, they're still going to need some people and they're saying that they're going to have like human ambassadors and stuff like that. These systems are also vulnerable to fraud and hacking and like one size fits all that doesn't fit everybody. And I think it'd be interesting to just talk about the idea of blockchainizing government stuff. Blockchains, you know, serve a interesting purpose in that they allow continuous public, super auditable and really redundant record keeping. You can do lots and lots and lots of things with that. Tokens, you know, are different than that, though. Tokens are the transmissibility. They're not the permanence. They're the thing that's being tracked, but it's the transmissibility that's important. So really, I think that it's just tuning whatever you're doing to meet your needs. You know, the, the tools are basically out there at this point, uh, with the various blockchains. I think that, you know, for as much as I complain about the BitShares guys, they're putting together some pretty solid tech and a lot of stuff can be built on something more than just Bitcoin. I think that Bitcoin was a good starting point, but not everything really wants mining decentralization in the way that it's sort of manifested. I don't know. I mean, Stephanie, what angle do you want to hit this from? I just want to emphasize that as long as it's voluntary, that's great. I'm not sure if I want more government in my life and I would like voluntarily go after it. (laughs) Like a lot of these things, I can pretty much take care of myself. But as long as it's voluntary and you're not forced to opt in and you can't, it's not like you can't opt out, then it's probably an improvement. Uh, it's an improvement and hopefully, I mean, the best part about an opt-in system is that at the point that you, you know, feel like you're not getting the value for what you're putting in or what it's costing you, then you can opt out. You know, you can stop opting in. So that's the difference is like, you're talking about extra layers. And the first thing that popped into my head is they are definitely extra layers. There's no possibility. Cause I mean, like, even if you revoke your citizenship and like give it up, unless you are going one of the very few places on earth, you still are under the legal jurisdiction of wherever it is that you happen to be at that point. And in some cases, you're in the legal jurisdiction of a very far flung power that just like has this, you know, this place through legacy things, things that happened hundreds and hundreds of years ago. And that, that might have been mm-hmm. dubious at the time, but have been codified into this is the reality that we live in. Until you can opt out of geopolitical governments, <laughs> it's just extra icing on the t- top of the cake or maybe on the top of the cake. <laughs> she may not you know, want. one of the few places where that's not true, I guess, would be a free zone project. There are a few of these being tossed around. Yeah. Zomia um, or like the Shenzhen. Do you know Mike Gagolsky, the stateless man? He yeah. Like, he, he basically went to the Shenzhen zone in Europe and like just ripped up his passport. <laughs> and so he just, he doesn't have a citizenship. He's just a stateless man. <laughs> and then Zomia is this like collection of islands. It's somewhere near China or like Malaysia or something. And they basically are just nomadic people, native people that have no governments and they just move around these islands. You know, it was interesting. Um, I just watched this debate. It's not specifically about Bitcoin. 
It's about money and its importance to society. And it's this debate between mm-hmm. Alistair Darling and uh, Alex uh, Salmond over Scottish independence. I have to back up a little bit and give you a little bit of detail on what's actually going on here. If Scotland leaves the UK, then the UK has told them that they will also have to leave the UK Currency Union, which means that in the eyes of the UK, uh, you know, the central bank, they will ha- they will stop being an official user of it. Would we be financially safe in an independent Scotland? Alice O'Donnell. Well, a lot of that depends on the currency we use. At the moment, the bedrock of our economy is the pound sterling. The pound sterling doesn't belong to any one of the individual countries in the United Kingdom. It belongs to the United Kingdom as a whole. The Bank of England stands behind it, and behind that, the UK government. And I know from my experience as Chancellor of the Exchequer, when I had to deal with the collapse of the banking system in 2008, the security that comes from uncovering a country that was large enough to deal with a collapsing bank, you remember the Royal Bank was almost the same size as the whole of the UK at that that time, meant I could do something about it. Whereas my Irish counterpart and my Icelandic counterpart, remember the Ark of Prosperity, they weren't so lucky because they weren't big enough. So that's why one of the reasons that I believe that Scotland is better and stronger together is by being part of the United Kingdom, we have that greater security. Now, of course, if you look at the wider economy, Scotland has an awful lot going for us. Uh, Our businesses, our firms do well, but I would argue that is because of the United Kingdom, not despite the United Kingdom. And when I look at jobs for our children and our grandchildren in a pretty uncertain world, I am very convinced it's in our best interest to be proud of what we do here in Scotland, proud of our identity, but we are equally proud to share in the wider United Kingdom because we get something bigger, something greater, greater security out of that as well. Alex Hammond? Well, uh, Jean asks the question, will we be safe and secure as an independent Scotland economically? The answer is yes, we will, Jean. Uh, Scotland, compared to other wealthy countries, we're 14th in the Organisation of Economic and Cooperation and Development. It's the rich man's club, as it's sometimes called, per head of population. But Alistair raised the currency, so let me uh, say, say exactly what we want to do in the currency. I'm looking for a mandate so that we can share sterling, the pound, in a sensible currency union with the rest of the United Kingdom. That's best because England and Wales and Northern Ireland are our biggest export market, and we are their second biggest export market, so it makes sense. Uh, I'm also looking, I know there's other options for Scotland. I mean, we could have a Scottish currency, we'd have flexible currency like Sweden or Norway does. We could have a fixed rate, a Scottish pound attached to the, the pound sterling. Uh, that's what Denmark does with the euro, or Hong Kong with the, the dollar. And no one can stop us using the pound sterling. It's an internationally tradable currency. Nobody can stop us using it. But we believe that the best option for Scotland, what I'm seeking a mandate for, is to have the pound sterling. So so we pay our messages, we pay our mortgage, we get our wages in the pound. I'm seeking the best option for Scotland so our prosperous economy keeps the pound sterling. Okay. This is very similar, actually, to what Panama does. Panama does not have a central bank. They use the U.S. dollar. The worst part about the Panama system is that you don't have a central bank. And since you don't have a central bank, you don't have the ability to do all the things that a central bank can do. So the Panama system is at the mercy of whatever governs its money uh, as far as its monetary fundamentals are concerned. So when um, the Fed prints money, it's also affecting Panama. And Panama can't really do anything about it outside of say, OK, well, this is so bad that we're going to use something else entirely. It's analogous here because Scotland can use the pound sterling all they want. The thing that they can't do then is deficit spend. And so that is the big threat that is being held over them is that without control of your own currency, you can't print new money to meet meet these liabilities. And the world that we live in now is basically built around the concept that that's what you have to do. That's how, that's how, you know, just life is lived. This is completely off topic. Like I said, it's, it's in my head because I watched it this morning and it was just so fascinating to see over and over and over again them talk about how the money is the thing that is the most important. That particular aspect of it, the part where, you know, where you can't borrow money or create money from nothing to then spend it on stuff that you, that the government wants, that's like the worst possible thing imaginable. It is possible in a few weeks' time, Scotland could choose to become an independent country. You've been in the Treasury. You know what, in your view, is not good for this country. What would be the best plan B option if it's not a country union? Honestly, 
they're all second best. Yeah, and I'm not going to argue for a second best option. You can't criticise Alex Salmon for not giving us a plan B. You're not giving us one either. I'm very clear. The pound sterling is best for Scotland, but the pound sterling is not, it's not like a CD collection that you split up on a divorce. The value of the CD, the value of the pound sterling is the Bank of England that stands behind it, and the UK government stands behind that. That's why the pound sterling is acceptable. Now, the lady up there was, ask, was asking about the, the euro. It is, it is the case that every country that has joined the European Union after 1996 has been obliged to join the euro. Now, we'd have to see in discussions what actually happened. Happened then, but in relation to the currency union, one of the, the yes, I'll be, well, be brief. Even if you got one, well, I can't understand why, as a nationalist, you'd want one. one because our borrowing, our tax, and our spend will be decided not in Edinburgh, by, but would then be a foreign well, government in London okay. because of the terms and conditions you were there. The format of these debates are, is so much better than you get with U.S. sorts of conversations about this stuff because they have lots of interaction from the audience, and so lots of good questions were asked. It was just really interesting because all, they, they would, at one hand, threaten and say, this, this thing is fundamentally unstable, and then hold it up and say, this is the thing that will save you. The, that's kind of the, the insanity of the world that we live in right now, is that it doesn't make any sense, but we can perpetuate the myth for a very long time by continuing to just do it and pretend like it doesn't matter, right? So mm. if that's what the world is predicated on, then anything that breaks away from that system has to fail. Because if it doesn't fail, it shows that there's actually a better way than perpetuating all of this, this garbage. The whole system is just completely predicated on, on, on all these ideas that fundamentally don't work, and yet we're continuing to do them because nobody else seems to have a better idea that preserves the existing power structure. I mean, that's really the only reason why you don't dismiss debts like this and don't settle a system like this, is because you want people who don't really have money to, to maintain the illusion that they have money, to companies that are really insolvent to maintain the illusion that they are solvent. And so you destroy everything along with it. Currency is about what we pay for the weekly shop. It's about interest rates, mortgage rates and rents, and the value of our pensions. And critically, currency, the money we use, is about being able to pay for public services upon which we all depend. If cryptocurrency were to step in here and save the day here, like let's just say Scotland was to leave and go to some kind of cryptocurrency how do you think they would like transition would they create their own cryptocurrency like in the government basically do the exact same thing with money printing where they'd have a central bank and issue this cryptocurrency or would uh, they buy into an existing cryptocurrency with the assets that they have and try to kind of pay off these debts i mean how do you see that working like a, a combination solution. First off, I should say that specifically during this debate, it was stated that uh, there's no prospect on the table that Scotland would start its own currency without a government being elected, which is going to take at least 18 months. That's not really on the table at this point. It's more just a question of, are they going to use, well, there's not a question. They're going to use pound sterling. It's just a question of whether they'll remain in the currency union or if they won't remain in the currency union. Also, we should mention, of course, that this is all predicated on Scotland successfully voting yes on uh, its independence vote, which is, I believe, taking place in about five days at the time of this recording. Um, and it won't, even if it's a yes vote, nothing's going to change for 18 months. And there's a swap over at that point. If somebody were going to use cryptocurrency for this, I don't know. There are a couple of these projects underway. You know, you could do it a variety of ways. But the point is, is that you need to get buy-in, right? It's not valuable if one person holds it. So I, I read something that uh, Paul Krugman wrote yesterday oh boy, I'm sorry. Uh, in the New York Times. He was asked about Bitcoin. Okay, so this was from an interview in Princeton Magazine. Do you think Bitcoin will gain momentum and become a viable currency? To which he responds, no, I could be wrong, but Bitcoin is harder to use than other forms of electronic payment and lacks any fundamental source of value, in parentheses, unlike dollars, which can be used to pay taxes. <laughs> so, <laughs> so the value of money comes from the ability to pay taxes with it. Well, it comes from acceptance, <laughs> Stephanie. It comes from acceptance. So that's what oh. they're doing is that, is that the, no the, wonder the people UK are so government. confused about economics because this well, is like, no, this is, this is a, this is a, I mean, it's a circular argument, but that's the thing. It, it is, and it is a coercion based argument too, Stephanie. This is one that says, yeah, the that government's not generating any value with the taxes. They're just basically extorting it from you. So, oh, the value of the dollar comes from the ability to pay extortion fees with it. That's, that's not well, real value. Like this. So, that's not trading okay, me, value for value. <laughs> no, it's not trading value for value, but that's not the point of what they're doing. Taxes are non-optional. Think about it, you know, think about a schoolyard 
where you have a bully who is like 10 years older than everybody else and there are no teachers there and he just goes around stealing from everybody whenever he wants. If he said rubber bands are the only thing I'm going to accept or I'm going to beat you up, then I bet your rubber bands become a very hot commodity in that schoolyard. And it's much the same way here. It doesn't matter what the token is. All that matters is the person who has the ability to force you to do something says, that's the thing I want. And so therefore, it's the thing you want so you can give it to me. Well, I guess he, that means he's right in a twisted way. People say fiat currency is not backed by anything. And actually, they are. They're backed by force, which is the force of the government forcing you to <laughs> use them and accept them. So um, I guess in a way, he's, he's completely right. It's all just based so, on but, force. But think about it for a second. What that means is that if Scotland wanted to start a currency, any kind of currency, whether it's paper dollars or cryptocurrency or rocks with, you know, special letters stamped on them. All they have to do is say to the, you know, country at large, we all agree that there are social programs that we want to, to fund. And for those purposes and for the purposes of protecting the country and whatever the other relevant things are, we think it's right that everyone contribute to those collective things. I'm not saying this is right. I'm saying this is how they actually give it value. And whatever the thing is that, you know, is the thing you pay in, that is the thing that becomes valuable there de facto. So it's not about whether it's cryptocurrency. It's about how do you start a currency? So for a new currency, don't you think people might be a little more skeptical of something like that, where it's just so obvious that it's like, okay, we're going to just decree that this is the money and you got to follow it or get beat up by the bully in the lunchyard? Well, to a certain extent, does it matter? I mean, like, well, yeah, it that's does how matter Bitcoin because started, people that's how it does matter because people have choices in this world and they can choose to use other currencies. No, nothing's stopping anyone from using Bitcoin or other, you know, fiat currencies if they wanted to in Scotland, if they don't believe in the legitimacy of the new Scottish dollar or whatever <laughs> that the government tries to make. And especially at the beginning when it's not, when it doesn't they're have, willing to break the law. Yeah. I mean, that's, that's abs important. Absolutely. It, it happens in Latin American countries. People don't use the fiat currency that they're supposed to use by the government. Right. But at the same time, that has a lot to do with the legitimacy, the perceived legitimacy by the people of the money. So that's what I'm saying. Right. Is so that what if the Scottish people don't perceive their government's money to be legitimate, whatever it just decides to create? I mean, we're talking hypotheticals oh, yeah. here, but it's totally, a, I could see that totally happening. Yeah, and I agree. I think that it's really, a, I mean, that's true of money in general. That's the whole thing about being able to print money in order to fulfill, you know, deficits is that it makes it so you don't have to recognize that people don't find your government to be legitimate, that don't, that given the choice, they wouldn't pay for that. Yeah. So that's, I mean, but that really is the problem, isn't it? That's, that's the problem at its core is the ability to create money without having to convince your people that it's worthwhile to give it to you or yeah, conversely you convince to them point by force. guns at them and say, give it to us or else. And that's what cryptocurrencies you know? do for, for humanity is give people the option to opt out of systems like that, at least in some areas of their lives and just say, no, I think I'll use the money that I actually find has value instead of the money that someone's uh, forcing me to use and accept. I think you're halfway there. I think that it gives people the opportunity to opt out of bad systems, but more importantly, it gives people the opportunity to build and then to participate in better systems. Bitcoin is great. It's a global opt out, but that's not, you know, it's, it's funny because I'm a localist in just about every way possible. You know, I think that the more we can decentralize and distribute power and decision making closer to the places that it's actually going to affect, the better it will actually be. And yet we have this global thing that is Bitcoin. And you can argue that all coins are global. A regional market makes much more sense. And so given the option of, well, would it be dollars or USD coin? Wouldn't it be better if it was USD coin? Because then again, like it takes the friction out of the equation. It makes it so that you can just be in USD coin for the times that you need to be in USD coin to pay your taxes or whatever. And it's easy because you're getting the advantages of cryptocurrency. And then, you know, with the rest of your money, you stay in other places that are less insane. And you get the benefit, frankly, of having every uh, possible jurisdiction imaginable available to you. Yeah, I mean, I suppose I don't really hear anyone proposing USD coin or that idea yet. But going back to just something that you said about localism, I guess that's some of my hesitation about this whole BitNation thing is that it's not really limited in size or anything like that. Like it could, you know, potentially there could be some worldwide BitNation that could become big. And, you know, we all know what happens when governments become big. We've seen this movie before. 
I don't know if I want those services. I know a lot of people are really comfortable with having governments sort of overarching them, telling them what to do, and they feel really safe in those little boxes, but I don't think I want it. I think I'd rather make those decisions on as local a level as possible, like down to the individual, down to the household, you know, about how I'm going to spend my money and save for retirement and get insurance and get contracts and stuff like that. Yeah, I just would rather deal more more locally, I guess. It's funny with the UK and Scotland thing. That would make both two smaller countries, frankly, two both powerful countries, countries with a lot of resources, but smaller countries. And I mean, is that bad? This show is brought to you by CryptoKit.com, the easiest, fastest way to use Bitcoin on the internet. This episode of Let's Talk Bitcoin is also sponsored by the Inside Bitcoin's Las Vegas Conference, which runs October 5th through the 7th. October 5th, day one, is a half day with workshops and more in-depth learning in two tracks. The full event kicks off on the 6th with networking opportunities and talks with familiar faces like John Mohan, Michael Perklin, Juan Llanos, David Johnston, and of course, our own Stephanie Murphy. Just focusing on keynotes, day one features Gil Luria, a managing director at Wedbush Securities, on sizing the opportunity for Bitcoin and digital currency technologies. After lunch, Bobby Lee of BTC China talks about the tremendous rise of the Bitcoin industry. Day one wraps up with Overstock CEO Patrick Burns' keynote on a topic quite close to my heart, which he calls crypto securities, the next decentralized frontier. Patrick's been teasing about an announcement, and I wonder what comes next. This event has dozens of speakers, and we're just about out of time. The event takes place in Las Vegas, running October 5th through the 7th. LTB listeners can save 10% on gold and silver passports by registering at InsideBitcoins.com with the code Let's Talk Bitcoin, all capitals, no spaces or punctuation. Today's magic word is Scott. That's S-C-O-T, Scott like in Scotland, not Scott like in the name Scott. You've got until the 30th of September to visit letstalkbitcoin.com and enter the magic word for your share of the listener rewards. I'm also pleased to announce we're accepting sponsors. Right now, only our wholesale system is placed. So basically, we auction packs of three sponsorships. That's one and a half shows worth of sponsorships. And each sponsorship is represented by a redeemable token called Sponsor. We auction these sponsor tokens to the highest bidder in LTB coin at auction.letstalkbitcoin.com. Whoever wins can then visit our calendar and has the ability to redeem them for an available minute of airtime, like you just heard. Or if they don't have a good use for them, they could perhaps sell them to a company or a person who does, and then that person or company can redeem them. Or even the person who purchased the token can facilitate the sponsorship for someone else and be paid in LTB coin, Bitcoin, or whatever else they can negotiate from the relationship. In the future, you'll be able to just visit a webpage and buy a sponsor token from someone who won it at an earlier auction and decided to resell it through that particular venue. To learn more, visit letstalkbitcoin.com and click the sponsor link for more information. Back to the show. When is the U.S. going to split up into five or six pieces? Can, can we do that? <laughs> can, well, we, I mean, can we seriously. succeed all the way down to the individual level? Like, really, I'm just so sick of these governments. I just don't want to participate. I mean, like, as we're recording this, this is September 11th. And just last night, Obama gave a speech about more war and how he's going to put more troops in the Middle East. And I'm just so sick of it. I'm so sick of being associated with it and paying for it. It's 2014. The world is changing. We have all these wonderful technological solutions. We can have peace and voluntary interactions. We just need to be able to say no to these governments and not participate well, if we don't want to. I think that's a big part of what something like BitNation attempts. I'm looking at this BitNation website right now. Maybe we could talk more about this. In a lot of ways, it seems like a really good idea. So please don't take this too harshly or whatever. But uh, what I see here is like we provide a cryptographically secure ID system, blockchain based dispute resolution, marriage and divorce, land registry, education, insurance, security, diplomacy, 
and more through a fully distributed platform. Marriage and divorce, really? Why are we still entangling the state with marriage or governmental systems with marriage? Like, why is that still well, happening? What I'm talking about is like the basic idea of making someone's loving relationship a legal entity. Why? <laughs> why do people still want to do that? I just don't understand. I mean, is if you, uh, it's it, this is going to get way like off into the woods here. But like, if you love someone, then that should be enough. Why do you have to like write a law about it and back it with force and say, oh, now you can't leave this relationship unless you go through the legal rig- rigmarole and now we're a family in the eyes of the state and we have to, you know, if, if one of you loving me, then there's going to be consequences for that. You took a vow. I've been married for five years now. Yeah, and I'm not <laughs> married and I, I don't plan on it. I, and yeah, that's just my no, uh, It's fine. Uh, <laughs> I bring it up because um, at the time we had been interested in getting married potentially, but the thing that pushed it over we get a Health much insurance? better tax return buying a house that year. Yeah. I, I don't blame you for that. And a lot of people get married for, for that reason. I know your wife, Crystal, she's awesome. And I know you love each other a lot. And I'm sure you'll be very happy together forever. But some people do get married for reasons like that, like health insurance or, you know, tax purposes or whatever. And then later on, my point they is, really regret it's about it. the incentives. Right. So they have to offer things like that because while there are some people who will do it for anachronistic reasons and, you know, just, hey, you know, that's just what you do. It's part of the tradition. I think they've done a good job of, uh, you know, I mean, we're talking about the U.S. government here, but this is just talking about the mar- the institution of marriage and government in general, I think, has done a good job of becoming part of the tradition that, oh, that's just what you do because it's what you've always done. But at the same time, I think that it's incentives like that that don't really make sense that are actually important because they push people towards using those institutions because you're right. Otherwise, you know, and we've seen marriage go down uh, in recent years, essentially, because, you know, people are less uh, sure of themselves and there are financial commitments that come along with being married. Marriage has gone down because it doesn't make as much sense anymore. And that's a market signal. You know, people are saying this doesn't make very much sense for my life. There's not many reasons to do this anymore. So the state is offering, you know, I heard the phrase, marriage is the health of the state once. And it's kind of true because they want everybody to be in these relationships where the state is is having some element of control over it. I mean, really, what's the point of registering your relationship with the state unless the state is going to have some influence and control over your relationship? And why would you want that if you weren't getting benefit? Conventional logic is someone has to manage the registry. Why does there have to be a registry? Why can't people just be in relationships and then if they don't want to, they just stop? Why does it have to be registered? I don't know. People like lists. I, I don't know. That's a good, lists, that's a good point. The Nazis it's good like point. lists. <laughs> well, yeah, the Nazis like lists. Okay, yeah, the Nazis also like pancakes. You can give me a problem for that too. <laughs> I'm just saying, like, it. I don't see a reason why that's some necessary function to like keep society together. There's a lot of people. No, you're right. You're right. It's you know, and again, this is this is the indoctrination that that certainly is in me at least <laughs> is that yeah, I mean, like I guess we don't really need a registry. There, you know, the argument in favor of that, I guess, is that there's incest concerns or something. But that's again, but you can marry like, your cousin kind of in most places. Is- I'm at age fourteen in the U.S. <laughs> you know, like it's well, yeah. And uh, Stephanie, if you get right down to it, you know, you can breed a couple of generations before you really get to the bad, you know, cross <laughs> genetics. So <laughs> and people do all the time, even. Th- Unmarried, you know, like it doesn't stop bad things like that from happening to have a legal system of marriage and divorce and stuff. Well, and- see, Stephanie, that's why it's also important to have the social stigma aspect of it oh. so that well, see, you know this, is, this is why you stig- have to get married. Otherwise, you know it's what immoral. else was socially stigmatized? Interracial marriage. That was the whole reason marriage certificates were issued so that they could say no. 60, 70 years ago in the southern U.S., Marriage certificates were issued because the government wanted to be able to say no to interracial couples who wanted to get married because they wanted to stop the miscegenation or whatever, the pe- the mixing of the races. We don't need that anymore. We've looped back around to Bitcoin. If you regulate something that is previously unregulated, then people have to ask you for permission and follow your rules where before they yeah. did not. Exactly. <laughs> exactly. That's the whole point. People are sold this bill of goods about marriage in particular, but so many of these other services too. Okay. Some of the other things on here, a uh, cryptographically secure ID system. Okay. Well, that sounds like a good idea, but you know, do we need, is that necessarily a governmental function? Like, do we really need like this organization that calls itself a government? Are you getting caught up with that maybe. designation? Yeah, maybe I, I mean, am. 
like a DAC isn't really a corporation, you know, I mean, they're, they're a real, so I, it seems like it's kind of the same thing. Is it, what it's trying to do is it's trying to emulate, obsolete, or replace, or supersede, I guess, um, some of the functions that people are used to governments performing. And so it's if calling it, like, itself a government, you know, but is that really like, okay, so education is another thing it says it's going to provide. Really? Do we need a government to provide education in an age where we can go on the internet and look up anything and teach ourselves anything we want to know? Really? It just... It's interesting, right? Because then you have to have, well, what are, what is it that we teach in our in our educational system? Who sets those standards? How many people oh, well, are there's involved? there's another rabbit you know, hole. And now the- I'm outing myself as this total crazy on the show, but <laughs> I think everybody knew that already. <laughs> but yeah, like, uh, I, you could argue that that's the point of government, quote, education as it exists today, is just to kind of indoctrinate people and get them thinking really inside the box and get them thinking in ways where they can't see the larger picture or they can't really form logical thoughts also everyone's forced to pay for it that's the other thing if you live somewhere you are forced to pay for this schooling whether or not you have children of your own you know whether or not you support it or agree with it you're paying property taxes or they're included in your rent if you're renting a place so basically unless you live in a maybe in your car uh, there's not really much way to escape paying for the government education that not everybody likes And then they have the nerve to say when you go and start a business by kind of unlearning a lot of this conformity that you learn in government schools, then they have the nerve to say, oh, you didn't build that because you got uh, education from the government. Most entrepreneurs actually have the courage to leave that educational system because they have thoughts in their own heads and they're kind of going against the grain in that way. Government schools don't teach you to be outside the box thinkers and entrepreneurial. They teach you to be to fall in line and conform. So. Okay, getting back to this BitNation thing, do we need that? Like, <laughs> do we want that? Do we want government of any kind, whether it's on a blockchain or a group of bureaucrats, to be providing all of these things? And can you opt out of individual stuff that you want to pay for or not? Well, the issue here is we don't know what these roles look like. We don't know, you know, what the educational system looks like. Maybe they're going to take the opportunity to create something that's fully collaborative and that essentially is just a, a scaffolding that lets people create educational frameworks within. I mean, like, we don't know any of yeah, this. Yeah, but stuff well, then why do we need um, to call so, the government? So, we have Udemy. We have uh, Udacity. We have all these courses online. We have all kinds of institutions already that have uh, sprung up to fill these functions without even using the word government. I mean, maybe that's just what's triggering me here, but it seems redundant, you know? (laughs) I think what's triggering you, Stephanie, is that you're looking at a project that is claiming to be decentralized, and you are seeing it refer to itself in a way that suggests monotony of viewpoint, right? You, You have a single viewpoint that is the viewpoint of the nation and therefore must be the viewpoint of the people who support it. It's the composite viewpoint, which means it's not really anybody's viewpoint. So I'm thinking a lot about how we're structuring Let's Talk Bitcoin. One of the things that we're doing is we're keeping it very decentralized and yet still with somewhat hierarchical control. What that means is that as the curator in chief or whatever we wind up calling that, I'm not going to actually be the one picking stories that get to the front page. I'm going to be delegating that responsibility through a token that I create to a variety of other people, each of which will have their own set of requirements and rules or whatever, however I decide to set it up. So you can do arbitrarily complex things using these systems. So you really could have a system that was very, very, very feedback oriented and very, very driven by the membership. We're not talking, I mean, like we have this artificial constraint of, you know, elections every two years because it's expensive to do real life elections. And it would be insane if you were constantly changing government, Go so goes the argument. That also removes the controls from the hands of people who vote once and then get stuck with the results. And chances are pretty much anything, you know, they could have voted for anyways was just as equally bad a result. So that's the thing is that like, When we move into these systems, the bit systems just generically, we remove that constraint that you have to have this gigantic, you know, upfront thing. It's just like 3D printing, right? You used to need 500,000 units ordered in order to make a thing. Now it's actually just as cheap to make one thing 3D printed as it is to make 100 things 3D printed. I think you are getting caught up on the word. I'd encourage you not to, you know, let's give these people a chance. Let's see how it's going to go. It might go horribly wrong, but it's an open source project. So worst case scenario, somebody forks it and does it right. Okay. You could say that, but I mean, words have meaning, you know, (laughs) to me, and I think to most people. What would you um, call it? 
I don't think I would do a project like this. I think like all the stuff that they're saying that they're going to provide because they're not really out yet. They don't really have a product launch yet. But all the stuff that they're saying they're going to provide is already being provided by multiple different services. It's just not all in one place. People are already working on this. There's already blockchain notary services. There's already decentralized education. There's already decentralized insurance and all kinds of other stuff. And so they're just kind of combining it all together in one place. So maybe in a way it is like a little bit centralized because they're kind of putting all these services under one umbrella. I think the key here is that you don't have to participate. It's it's awesome that they're using the word voluntary, saying it's totally opt-in. You don't have to participate. This is great. This is what some people refer to as a polycentric legal order, where you can kind of pick and choose your own governments that are not tied to geographic land masses. Some people really like that idea. And I would say it's probably even an improvement on what we currently have. You don't have that element of choice and the governments are tied to land masses. The concern I have, I guess, is that What if a lot of people do start to use this? Any software has vulnerabilities, right? I realize that systems of people have corruption and all the human flaws that go with that. Software has vulnerabilities too. What about hackers? What about people who just kind of learn to game the system and like use the rules to their advantage and kind of get whatever they can get on the blockchain? That can happen in a blockchainized system too. Some of those applications I am kind of concerned about. What if there's a ID that happens on BitNation, right? And suddenly everyone has this BitNation ID and it's starting to be used to pay for things. It starts to be used for a lot of different things, maybe to identify you online or whatever. And then there's some vulnerability where somebody uh, gets into that system, gets people's data or changes and manipulates the data or just games the system and gets a bunch of IDs and uses them as sock puppets or I can't even really say from a technical perspective exactly what the attack would be, but every system is vulnerable to some kind of attack. And so what form will that take in a system like this, in like the BitNation kind of paradigm? That's going to happen regardless of the system. People will always look at wherever you have concentrations of power. People will look, see what they can you know, get and what the, the value is. They'll do the mental math, basically, and then they'll try and game the system. Yeah, I think that's totally consistent with what we've seen throughout human history. But the thing is, is that in the current system that happens behind closed doors, usually, you know, money pass, it changing hands, things like that. Uh, and it's something that is very occluded that we cannot see that some someone somewhere might see it, but they're not anyone that wants to do anything about it. And, you know, I mean, that's just. It seemed like that's been the system for a while. And so with a system that's based on blockchain technology, yeah, you absolutely have those vulnerabilities, but there's also the complete transparency. So if you are actually, I mean, like if you've created a system that has this transparency built in as cryptocurrency system uh, based systems should, then anytime someone games a system, you can basically just think about it like it's a bug bounty or something, right? Because in gaming the system, they have demonstrated a new way that it can be gamed, which then can be addressed, and everybody has the in, has it in their best interest to address them, because one person gaming the system does so at the expense of all the other. It's perpetuating this, uh, for lack of a better phrase, I'll call it the slave on slave mentality, the uh, the horizontal enforcement of laws that we see today, where people snitch on others for breaking laws, and they get bounties from police, and they snitch on other people to the IRS for not paying their taxes if they think their neighbor's not paying taxes or whatever, and they get bounties for that. It it kind of just still perpetuates this idea, oh, this person's gaming the system, I got to report them to the blockchain administrators or whatever. It's not exactly a very community building, <laughs> bringing people together kind of mindset. Well, so if somebody has hacked, you know, a Bitcoin you know, in some way. Yeah, with Bitcoin, uh, yeah, but if somebody hacks the marriage blockchain, I don't really feel that concerned about it because that's a service that I don't want. But isn't that because you don't care about marriage? Yeah, exactly, because I it's a service I don't want. Like some of these stuff that 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 BitNation is talking about providing, I think that they're not necessary. They're not like things that I really want anyway. Like I don't, I would prefer not to have a driver's license. The only reason I do is because I want to drive without being arrested and, you know, put in jail, put in a cage. Um, I would like to not have one and I would like to not have a bit ID either. You know, like why don't we just uh, be human beings and not, not need to catalog and track ourselves? You know what I mean? Like I just, 
I don't want some of these it things. It sounds like BitNation is not for you, <laughs> Stephanie. I, I, yeah. I, I, can, I totally, I totally understand where you're coming from on this. And, you know, and I mean, that's fundamentally what it seems like is the case here is that, you know, there will be a fork of BitNation that excludes the, the things, you know, that's the, that's the, like the correct libertarian version. And that, you know, covers a couple of things that people actually want and everything is opt in or opt out and you only pay for the things, you only participate, you only endorse the things that you actually want and use. And I mean, like, it seems like that's kind of why BitNation is okay but, is because but a thing, lot of people do yes, want that stuff. A lot thing, of people want welfare, Stephanie. Yes, I realize that. <laughs> and now you can't opt out of paying for money that goes to give people welfare and corporate welfare is way bigger. Like individual welfare is kind of like a drop in the bucket compared to co- corporate welfare at least in the U.S. But anyway, the thing is, yeah, I don't want some of these services that BitNation provides, but I think the ones that I do want, like, you know, maybe internet-based educational courses, are already being provided by other um, entities, and they're not being lumped into this kind of centralized system that's being branded as a government. I'm kind of failing to see how BitNation is, like, moving us forward in that arena of being freer from different types of controls. Yeah, I get that you can opt out and it's voluntary, okay. but it's it's still... Well, so, little- okay, but, but the water is getting muddy is the point, is that things used to be very specific and now they're getting very muddy. So, again, I'm going to talk about, uh, let's talk Bitcoin.com for a second because... I'm involved with a couple of projects that are involved in the crowdfunding space. If you are a crowdfunding website, the thing that you want to do is you want to build a community so that you can then sell them stuff. What is the difference between a crowdfunding website and let's talk Bitcoin.com, which has several thousand members that are on it frequently? Nothing. The only difference is, is that we have not gone through the, uh, jump through the regulatory hoops in order to have the correct licensing and all this stuff in order to do crowdfunding through the U.S. dollar system. But with the new types of token crowdfunding, there's really no difference except that we have a large starting community that already trusts us and, you know, is on board with what we're doing. And all of these other startups that are just getting started now don't. So that's what I'm saying is that it's it, once you have the community, that's what's the, that's what the important part is. And so it's, you shouldn't think about anything like it's monolithic. You should think about the game now is not to provide services. It's to provide the right mix of services so that that the individual people you are trying to reach find you to be the most appealing option and decide to spend their time with you. Not because it's the best option amongst a, bu- a bunch of bad ones, but because it's the best option amongst a bunch of ones that are built from this open source, very powerful platform. And then from there customize what the specifics are to meet each basically archetype uh, we call people archetypes now right <laughs> particular wants and desires so that's i mean so so bit nation is specific but it's it's a it's a first i mean that is something that's important as far as i'm concerned from what they're doing here and the work that they will do you know if they continue with the project there will be many 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 forks and they will meet every taste and so then you know, I mean, don't participate in anything or participate in the one that exactly meets your needs. And also then, hey, you're socializing with people who agree with you on pretty much everything. Yeah, exactly. That's what it comes down to. So, I mean, yeah, it's it's like it's, it's really, like global tribalism. Y- yeah. And, and tribalism is another word that makes me really wary because it can justify some really bad things. Uh, so, I, you know, BitNation is a really interesting idea. And I would say say that it looks on its face it really looks like it's genuinely an improvement over what we have today i think i maybe would go a step further and say i don't necessarily want some of the things that it provides some of the controls all right so stephanie i think we can sum it up as you are skeptical and i am hopeful (laughs) is that fair i'm hopeful too i'm hopeful too Uh, what we really need to do is just get rid of these geopolitical governments that are just waging wars all over the place and forcing us to use their money that's what i would say that's the biggest fish to fry i think hang around a while Thanks for listening to this episode of Let's Talk Bitcoin. Content was provided by Stephanie Murphy and Adam B. Levine. Today's episode was sponsored by CryptoKit and Inside Bitcoin's Las Vegas. Music for this episode was provided by Jared Rubens and General Fuzz. Have a good one. <laughs>